I was born into a Buddhist family, uh, supposedly Buddhist family, but my parents knew very little about Buddhism. And my mother used to bring me to this uh, Taoist temples, Chinese temples quite often, especially when she had problems. And uh, I went to a Catholic school for 12 years from Standard 1 right up to Form 6. And I was very much influenced by these uh, Catholic brothers, Christian brothers, because uh, they came over from Ireland, from Canada, from France, at a young age, in the early 20s. And they were very dedicated, and they were extremely nice people. And they lived here until they died. And in our school we had these uh, graves of these old uh, Christian brothers. So I was extremely affected by them. And so I was uh, very much taken up by the Catholic religion. So much so that I used to go to the chapel every day as one of the goody goody boys. <laughs> and I suppose they probably noticed who were these kids that would come to the chapel every day. Probably they were peeping behind the curtain. And they organized special classes for us, a few of us, and tried to get us to convert to the Catholic religion. So when I was in Form 5, I had this view that I would definitely baptize as a Catholic one day, in spite of what my parents uh, uh, say. And that was in Form 5 when I was about 17 years old. But when I was in Form 6, when I was about 18, this computer started to work. <laughs> And I had a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, like uh, if God is merciful, why did he create hell? God is almighty, he can create heaven for all beings. We don't have to go to the ghost realm, to the hell realm. And when we uh, brought these questions to these uh, Catholic uh, brothers, they, they just couldn't answer, give us a satisfactory answer. Another question was like, uh, if God is omniscient, He knows the past, He knows the present, He knows the future. So when He makes a being, He knows that in future this being is going to go to heaven or go to hell. And if He knows that being is going to go to hell, then He should put on hold, <laughs> not, uh, not continue to create that being. So these questions disturbed me. So one day I had to go to the chapel and uh, tell God, very sorry, but I have so much doubts I can't continue to come to the chapel every day. <laughs> so I decided I was going to uh, separate myself from this Catholic religion for a while. And so I left religion for a few years. And being a young man at that time, you know, uh, young, uh, young men like to chase up <laughs> young women. <laughs> So I, I, I got pretty interested in the opposite sex and all that a few years. And then uh, I, didn't know, I didn't come into contact with religion for many years. But when I started working, I was in the government service and I was posted from Kuala Lumpur to Johor. They are the extreme for three years. Then I came back to Kuala Lumpur for three years. And I was posted to Kuantan, which was on the on the east coast of Malaysia. I was there for five years and was looking after the electrical and mechanical installations in a big military camp. Yeah, they had the Air Force, the Brigade, the Raki unit. And when I was there, because uh, our services were quite essential to the military, they, they kind of uh, wanted to be on very friendly terms with us. So they let me stay in the officers' quarters. I was given a room there. So I mixed with the uh, officers and uh, dined like a military officer. <laughs> you know, every day when we eat on the, on, the, on, the, on the table, there'll be this Batman standing beside you. They provide you with all that cutlery. And when you finish, you're supposed to put your fork and spoon next to each other in a straight line and they'll know that and they'll take away the, the, the plate and they'll come with a cup of coffee and all that. So when I mixed with these uh, military officers, uh, being a young man, we had uh, a 
reasonably uh, kind of wild life, not not too wild, but uh, uh, being interested in girls and beer every day and all that. And I had a uh, kind of uh, people would view me as a I can join life. <clears throat> but after a few years, I had this funny experience. I used to have dreams at night, and these dreams always it was about ghosts. I always dreamt of ghosts at night, and I started to scratch my head and wonder why, why I keep dreaming of ghosts. Then I came to the conclusion that although on the outside people see me as a very happy person, enjoying life, yet there must be I must be unhappy within. Then I realized that it was a sp spiritual vacuum that was lacking in me being uh, basically a person who was uh, more interested in religion. So I went back on this uh, spiritual journey and to study the Bible again and I studied Hinduism and uh, Taoism, Sikhism, Baha'i and because I was quite nice to my office uh, staff, one Malay man gave me the Quran. <laughs> the English translation of the Quran, hoping that by reading it I'll become a Muslim probably. <laughs> and I did read the Quran. Uh, and at that time, uh, after studying so many religions, I couldn't come into contact with a Buddhist book because uh, that time was in the 1970s. And in Malaysia, it was quite difficult to find a Buddhist book in English. There were many Chinese in Chinese, but not in English. So, one day when I went to Kuala Lumpur for a meeting, I passed by this uh, Thai Wat in Pataling Jaya, Jalan Gasing. And it was quite a nice uh, monastery compared with uh, other monasteries in the sense that uh, they had a big uh, uh, garden, uh, they had plants, uh, not like this, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese temples, they are just all concrete, even the floor is all concreted, it's very hot. But uh, in this Thai monastery, it had a lot of plants, so I went in, I drove in. And then I went into that big hall and I saw this big Buddha statue. And mentally I spoke to this Buddha statue, I said, if you are supposed to be a holy man, why don't you show me your books? I've been looking all over for your books and I can't find a single book. Then I left. Three days later, <clears throat> my nephew, who comes from a very staunch Catholic family, gave me a Buddhist book. <laughs> and I read that book. It actually was written by Venerable Dhammananda in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Bricksfields Temple, What Buddhists Believe. And I found it to be quite logical wasn't extremely impressive. That was the first edition, I think, of the, the book. But uh, it seemed very logical, and so I was interested to pursue it. So I went to the Brickfields Temple and I got more books. And after that, I went to the University of Malaya and got more Buddhist books to read. And then I realized that uh, Buddha's teachings is very deep compared to other religions. It doesn't talk about God. In other religions, uh, the, the, the soul, the, the, the main thing about the religion is uh, belief in God. But in Buddhism, it, it seemed to be very profound. I couldn't uh, really understand it, but I felt that there was something in it, something deep and profound. So I studied more and more of the books, and slowly the jigsaw puzzle started to take shape. Slowly I saw the overall picture. And I was uh, more and more impressed. When I switched over to Theravada and um, studied the suttas and found this contradiction between Mahayana and Theravada, I was, I felt cheated and I also felt that I wanted to enlighten many people because most of the Buddhists in Malaysia, they are Mahayana 
and I was I, I was practically uh, I, I was one of the first monks to switch from Haryana to Theravada and many people were surprised because they thought how can a higher vehicle <laughs> monk become a, a lower vehicle monk so I started to write books the first book I wrote was Return to the Original Buddha Teachings trying to bring people back to the original Buddha teachings and um, in this book there were three articles one was on Vinaya, monks Vinaya wanted uh, lay people to know a bit more about the monks Vinaya so that uh, they could see who was not practicing keeping the precepts and then uh, another book was about vegetarianism how it's not really necessary in uh, original Buddhism and the third one was uh, misconceptions and contradictions in Buddhism. <clears throat> and I think the Mahayana monks and nuns were very upset with the Vinaya article because it exposed many of them. <laughs> because they were accepting money and driving Mercedes cars and all that. And then the lay people, uh, Mahayana lay people, many of them were upset over the vegetarian article. <laughs> And, uh, because they thought monks and nuns should be vegetarians. So much so that um, there were at least two Buddhist centers, one in Kelantan, one in Trungano, that burned this book of mine. <laughs> and especially the second book I wrote, uh, which was the main differences between Mahayana and Theravada teachings, and which, which was basically mainly based on the uh, uh, writings of uh, Professor Rhys Davids, uh, he said that uh, Theravada is actually original Buddhism. Mahayana grew, uh, developed uh, much later. So, um, organizations like the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia, they, uh, they, how do you say, they, they put me in that black book. <laughs> And they co storage me because uh, the leader of this organization is a Mahayana monk. I got to know about this because from somebody inside the organization. <laughs> now, in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, uh, the books always talk about uh, Mahayana and Hinayana, high, higher vehicle and lower vehicle. And, uh, we find this is this does not occur in uh, early uh, suttas of the Buddha in Theravada teachings. So that itself makes it obvious that it, 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 Mahayana sutras grew developed at a later time. And um, the main difference between Mahayana and Theravada is that Mahayana they um, teach that. To become a Buddha, you have to take many, many lifetimes. Something like four Asantya Kappas and 100 Maha Kappas, which is like an infinite length of time. In other words, don't practice now, it's no use. <laughs> and they have this Kwan uh, Yin Bodhisattva or Tara, Avalokiteswara, and Amitabha Buddha and Medicine Master Buddha, which is not found in Theravada. So, they also have this uh, external uh, kind of uh, saviour that you could uh, pray to, which is not uh, the Buddha's teachings. So, <clears throat> the teachings are different and even the practice of Vinaya is different. Uh, they talk about the Bodhisattva vows and in this uh, Bodhisattva precepts they even uh, discourage you to go alone into the forest to practice it's not allowed in the uh, Bodhisattva precepts so all these contradictions uh, can be found and uh, on top of that if you investigate Mahayana teachings you find the contradictions inside Mahayana teachings for example the Amitabha Buddha Sutra says that uh, if you recite the Amitabha Buddha's name, you'll be reborn in the pure land. And then in the uh, Chinese uh, Six Patriarch Sutra, Sutra of Huineng, they asked him, is it true if you recite the Buddha's name, you can be reborn in the pure land? And he said, if your, if your heart or your mind is pure, the pure land is very near. 
if your mind is impure or your heart is impure, the pure land is very far. And then he also said, foolish people recite the Buddha's name, uh, wishing to be reborn in the pure land. Wise people purify their heart. So uh, these are some of the contradictions. And then another one is the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, or Sitika Abha Sutra, where it says that in the beginning when the Buddha was about to preach this uh, sutra, millions and millions of Buddhas came to listen. But in the uh, Theravada Suttas, the Buddha says that an Arahan or a Buddha, once he enters Nibbana, he does not come back anymore. He, no one can see his, his body or hear his voice again, which actually also is found in the Diamond Sutra. In the Diamond Sutra, it says that uh, uh, the Mahayana uh, Diamond Sutra, it says that uh, now that the Buddha has entered Nibbana, if you think you want to see him again or hear his voice or, or, or touch him, then you don't understand the Dhamma. You have gone the deviant way. And this contradicts uh, this uh, Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, where it says that millions and millions of Buddhas came. So now, this uh, thing about the Mahayana teachings. Nowadays, people say they want to practice Mahayana teachings, and yet, at the same time, they say that uh, people who were born during the Buddha's time, they have higher paramis, that's why they are born during the Buddha's time. Uh, here is where the contradiction lies, because uh, they claim that the Buddha's Arahan disciples could not understand the higher teachings. That is why uh, the higher teachings were hidden away from them. And this uh, Nagarjuna had to go to the ocean, the dragon's palace, and, and recover these uh, Mahayana Sutras to teach to the people now. But if the Buddha's disciples cannot understand the higher teachings. How can the people nowadays understand the higher teachings? <laughs> they don't have a fraction of the wisdom of Sariputta or, or, or Moggallana. Now, the main difference probably you could say between Mahayana and Theravada teachings is that in the suttas, the Theravada suttas, the Buddha says that the Dhamma has a flavor, one flavor, a flavor of liberation. But you cannot find this in Mahayana sutras. There is no, absolutely no flavor of liberation in the Mahayana Sutras. It's all extolling the Bodhisattvas, praising the Bodhisattvas. If we uh, look in some, into some of these Mahayana Sutras carefully, uh, with a clear mind, you, you find uh, some of them actually don't hold water. For example, the Amitabha Sutra, it says that uh, you you recite the Buddha's name and you can be reborn in the pure land. Firstly, this contradicts the uh, Theravada Sutra, the Sutta, where the Buddha says that uh, uh, no amount of prayers or vows can get you what you want. You have to work for it, do the right thing, create the right conditions to get you what you want. And then there's another Sutta where a Brahmin came to ask the Buddha. He says that they believe that when their relative passes away, they hold up his corpse and make him look skywards and uh, call out his name and he will go to heaven. Then he thought that the Buddha, being a Samasam Buddha, uh, Arahan, uh, with psychic powers, could bring everybody to heaven. And the Buddha gave the simile that if you threw a stone into water, the stone would sink. But if you threw oil into water, the oil would float. So the Buddha says, uh, person with heavy karma is like a, a stone that sinks to the bottom. So a person with evil karma, the evil karma will drag you down to the woeful plains. But a person with good karma will float up like the oil to heaven or to a human realm. So it, it just goes against the uh, Buddhist principles. We talk about this Amitabha Sutra again and another one, the Filial Piety Sutra. In the Amitabha Buddha Sutra, Sutra uh, this idea about reciting the Buddha's name can bring you to the pure land. And they claim that this is based on the vows of the Amitabha Buddha, on who out of compassion made these vows to help living beings. But if Amitabha Buddha was really compassionate, then why should 
he had this condition where he where you have to recite his name before you you go to heaven. Is it like somebody telling you, uh, you want my help? Sure, you kiss my feet. <laughs> if a person is compassionate, there's, there's no reason for any condition to be put. If he puts any condition, that means he only wants to help certain people, not, not, not other people. It's just like Christians saying, uh, you have to be baptized before you can go to heaven. So if you are not baptized, you cannot go to heaven. That's putting a condition. That's not reasonable. That's, that, that, that's not the uh, characteristic of a compassionate person. So it goes against logic. The other one is the uh, Filial Piety Sutra. In this Sutra, the Buddha was supposed to be walking the forest. Then he saw the bones of a, the bones of a human skeleton on the ground. And then he bowed down to the uh, skeleton, <laughs> paid respect to the skeleton. And Ananda was surprised and Ananda asked him, Bhagava, living beings bow to you. Why do you bow to this, uh, this skeleton? And then the Buddha was supposed to have said, um, Ananda, you have shallow wisdom. You don't understand the Tathagata. <laughs> These uh, bones uh, could have been the parents of the, the, of the Tathagata in a past life. <laughs> And people without wisdom, when they when they read this, and they they simply accept it. But if it is possible that the Buddha can bow to a pile of bones, and and it's not even living, so if the pile of bones were alive, all the more reason to to bow, isn't it? Now suppose the the, the, the Buddha. In fact, the Buddha said you can hardly meet any living being eh, who has not been your mother or your father or your relative before in the past. So okay. Now suppose one day the Buddha meets meets a pig <laughs> who was his previous life mother, then he should bow all the more to that pig, to the <laughs> or he meets uh, his disciple who was his uh, mother or his father before, then he should bow to the disciple. But is it the Buddha bowing to the disciple or is it the disciple bowing to the Buddha? <laughs> so it just doesn't make uh, any sense. Okay, we'll talk about the Vimala Kirti Sutra. This is one of the few, uh, several uh, Mahayana Sutras that try to belittle Arahants, and in particular Sariputta. And in the Theravada Suttas, the Buddha always prays Sariputta as the disciple with the highest wisdom. And the Buddha says that just like an emperor or a king has a crown prince. So in the same way the Buddha said the Dhamma Raja, the king of the Dhamma, namely the Buddha, has a son and that son is Sariputta and the Buddha always prays Sariputta. But in the Mahayana Sutra they try to uh, belittle uh, the Arahants and in particular Sariputta and in this Vimalakirti Sutra they talk about this uh, layman called Vimalakirti who was supposed to be like a man of the town, you know, he, he's a real uh, social light he goes to bars, goes to karaoke, goes to uh, drink beer and all that. And at the same time, he is the top most in wisdom, same on par with Manjushri Bodhisattva. Mm. So it seems he met this uh, Sariputta and, uh, and then this uh, dragon lady came, came down to converse with them. And according to this sutra, the moment Sariputta saw this uh, dragon lady, just because she was a woman, not a man, he was very uncomfortable. <laughs> he wasn't happy that a woman was uh, coming to talk to them. And then uh, <clears throat> it seems uh, this dragon lady was uh, seized off by Sariputta. So she knew that Sariputta didn't have psychic power and she used her psychic power to make these uh, heavenly flowers fall from the sky. And as soon as they touch this uh, uh, Vimalakirti and Manjushri Bodhisattva, they just shake it off and the flowers would fall off. But when they fell on Sariputta and he tried to shake it, shake the flowers away from his ropes, they stuck to his ropes. <laughs> In other words, they, uh, they want to make him look like a fool. <laughs> and then um, she had her fun and then uh, she uh, turned into a Buddha. <laughs> and flew away. 
<laughs> this contradicts, of course, contradicts the, the Theravada Suttas that a, 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 a female cannot become a Buddha, although a, a lady can become an Arahant. So this is uh, just a typical sutra, trying to uh, really put down Sariputta. In the Yanguta Nikaya, the Buddha encouraged uh, monks to speak out against our Dhamma and to speak the real Dhamma. And the Buddha always referred to the real Dhamma as the suttas. In the Yanguta Nikaya also, the Buddha said that if any monk says that such and such is the Buddha's teachings, you have to compare it with the suttas the original suttas and the Vinaya. And if it does not conform to the suttas and the Vinaya, then he said to reject it. So unfortunately nowadays a lot of monks, they teach from later books like the commentaries and the Abhidharma and the Visuddhimagga. But I think we should all go back to the suttas because uh, there are a lot of practical teachings in the suttas. How to practice, how to conduct oneself, etc. There's a wealth of information, practical information. That's why the Buddha says that his Dhamma is, always has the flavor of liberation. So if we are aiming for liberation, we should always go back to the original words of the Buddha. If we were to study the words of the Buddha, we, are, we would have this feeling like we are sitting next to the Buddha. He's here amongst us, teaching us. And, uh, Initially, when I started to learn the suttas, I was very much taken up by it, so I spent a lot of time um, reading the suttas. And some monks criticized me for not following a teacher. But then, after studying the suttas, then I found that the Buddha said, in the future, when I'm not around, the Buddha said, take the suttas as your teacher. And we encourage us to go here and there looking for a teacher. In fact, if a person understands the, 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 the Dhamma, has attained stream entry, the Buddha says, he becomes independent of others in the Buddha's dispensation, who may not be running here and there looking for a teacher. Uh, so the, actually the sign of, the, the one of one's, one of the signs of a person, if he has entered stream entry, is that he would not be chasing after teachers. So uh, it is our great fortune that the, the true Dhamma is still with us. The Buddha said when he contemplated the past 91 world cycles, he only saw six Samasambuddhas. And out of the six, three were already on this, uh, uh, this, this kappa, this world cycle. In other words, for the last 90 world cycles, he only had three Samasambuddhas, or like uh, one in 30 world cycles. That's an extremely, extremely long time. So we are indeed very, very fortunate now that the true Dhamma is with us and we should make use of this opportunity. We may not meet it again for a very, very long time.